you're a seasoned investor or new to the game, um, this is going to be a great session to help you in build your due diligence practices. Um, there's a lot of information that public companies, um, especially, but private companies as well, need to disclose. And there's places where they have to report information. Um, luckily, we have three experts here today who are going to help us figure out what those are and where to find them. Um, so our panel discussion today is how ESG is affecting the world of disclosure. Um, there is a lot of new information that is coming to market um, around ESG practices and mandates. So um, I'd like to welcome... Um, Bill Gilliland, Partner, Corporate Securities, M&A, Governance, Power Industry, Sustainable Finance with Dentons. Is that on your business card, that whole title? It's a fold-out card. It's a fold-out card, perfect. Um, so Bill, uh, he is a lawyer with Dentons, and he is based out of Calgary. He came all the way out here. Thank you very much for traveling out, Bill. Uh, we're then going to move to Edward Olson. Um, Edward is Partner, Enterprise Risk Services and Leader, Environmental, Social and Governance with MMP. Again, does that fit on your business card? All right. Thank you, Edward. Edward uh, runs the ESG um, uh, practice with MMP, and he is based out of Kelowna, so he is local. Thank you very much, Edward. Um, and then Seth Foreman, he's president of ESG with Social Suite, and he joined us from New York. He almost didn't make it, um, and he has a smaller business card, but thank you very much, Seth, for joining us today. Um, so they're each gonna do a presentation, and then I'm gonna bring them all up here, and we will have a panel discussion. Thank you again. Okay. <clears throat> no, no, let you go up in this seat. Oh, okay. Solo time. Solo time. I'll stand you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we can go to the purple slide that I think is up uh, next. Yeah, there you are. I only have one slide. So thanks uh, for having me here. Really appreciate the opportunity. Um, I run Denton's Canada's ESG practice in Canada, which we call the ESG Igniter Group. The main focus is not to wrap our, arm, our group's arms around all ESG work because it's just a massive area, but we're really trying to be an all-disciplinary practice to push ESG knowledge and, uh, and really the ability to provide practical advice in the space to all of our lawyers. So um, I bring that perspective. I'm also on the board of a pension fund in our pension plan in Canada, so I actually bring a bit of an investor hat perspective to this as well. So they've asked us just to so sort of uh, make a few key uh, points in our brief introduction here. And so uh, I've got one slide that you can see. And I think we're going to talk about all these things in more detail. But the first one uh, is I often say ESG means a lot, but it can also mean basically nothing, right? And that really leads us into the concept of greenwashing, um, but uh, social washing as well. But the other equally relevant thing for public companies, because you're trying to get your message out there, the uncertainty around greenwashing and so on can lead to green hushing or social hushing. So companies that are afraid to make statements and comments around what they're doing in the area because they're concerned about regulatory or litigation risk. Okay. Um, great news yesterday. Uh, the International Sustainability Standards Board, the ISSB, which is part of the IFRS organization that all public companies in the room will be familiar with, released its first two sustainability standards, S1 and S2. The first is a, a general sustainability uh, disclosure standard that, that uh, is, captures really all areas of sustainability, but the more immediately relevant one uh, that uh, companies would be free to adopt for 2024. Um, would be their S2, so climate-related disclosure standards. So this is pretty significant, not because the ISSB standards are themselves mandatory, they're still uh, voluntary, but they really reflect a coalescence of the multiplicity of acronyms and voluntary standards that we're probably familiar with you know, within that one ISSB framework. And I think um, uh, we can expect in Canada um, our Canadian securities regulators to have a real serious hard look at what the ISSB uh, disclosure standards require when they, I think, come up with their next version of the National Instrument 51107 climate change disclosure uh, proposals that they issued, uh, frankly, before anyone else in North America did. But uh, they've stated that they really want to support what the ISSB has done as a global 
uh, baseline standard for disclosure. So I think those ISSB rules are, are ones that, that folks should have a look at. Um, uh, Bill S211, which is uh, colloquially known as the uh, child, you know, child labor, um, slave labor uh, legislation, that's going to be very relevant, I think, for uh, all public companies starting in 2024, regardless of size. Uh, we'll need to make disclosure about their supply chain and the due diligence they're doing to ensure there's no um, child labor or unfair labor practices and so on built into their supply chain. So that's, those, are, those are important. And these are all things that are going to help companies uh, get more comfortable uh, you know, in terms of making disclosure and avoiding greenwashing and help get over the green, the green hushing, the social hushing issue. But the last point is, uh, is uh, you know, an OSFI of, uh, Office of Superintendent of Financial Institutions, which is a federal organization, um, issued a guideline which is really targeted at our big commercial banks, all of the big banks, um, telling them that starting in 2024, they are going to have to make climate risk related financial disclosure. So all of the things that the TCFD has required, all of the things that the ISSB has kind of modeled. And just the key message from my perspective is that um, in, that influence is gonna come from the financial sector, investors, um, is gonna require that anyone dealing with them is gonna have to provide the disclosure those banks need in order to make their own disclosure. So whether you're a private company, a, a large public company, a small public company, uh, any kind of organization that may deal with a bank, and there are other organizations that deal with uh, similar similar concepts for institutional investors, um, they're going to be driving the, uh, <coughs> the the required disclosure that I think all companies are going to make. So with that, I'll just turn it over to Ed Olson. Thanks, Bill, and good morning, everybody. It's really great to be here. I, I felt a little bit sobered when Tanya threw up the date 1973 and said, what's important about it? Tanya, that's my birth year as well, so you must be extremely young like I am, which is really great, so thank you. Uh, I, I sit on CPA Canada's Sustainability Reporting Advisory Committee. I'm the co-chair of the Praxity Alliance Global ESG Committee. Um, I also sit on ISO uh, greenhouse gas uh, guidance globally. And you know, there's three things that come to mind that we're trying to achieve with uh, sustainability reporting. The first is consistency, the next is comparability, and the third is transparency. Those principles are absolutely fundamental to the information that investors are gonna need. And why is that a problem right now? Well, you can just open up and Google search ESG standard or framework and you have a plethora of about everything under the sun. And while there has been some consolidation and consistency, which is a good thing, I actually do celebrate what Bill just brought up right now, the International Sustainability Standards Board. There are two sustainability related standards, IFRS S1 and S2. Why? Because it's going to be setting a global baseline. Now, does that mean it's all going to apply in Canada? Likely not. But what I'm working with the chair of the Canadian Sustainability Standards Board on is we need something that does not vary Canada too far globally because we need to go back to the consistency and the comparability that a company in Germany can be compared to that of a company in Canada and we can understand what is your sustainability positioning because at the end of the day, as investors and as companies, you need to know business resilience. Are you going to be here for the long term? And the long term includes many different environmental and social issues that need to be wrapped around the right governance framework. And to me, those are the challenges in the Wild West that we're trying to bring consistency to because ultimately, when I am, I might be a little bit of a sustainability nerd right now, when I jump on flights, I pull up sustainability reports and I read them. Here's the caution I give to you as consumers or even developers of reports. Volume is not value. And I see too many voluminous reports that if you're an old, okay, this is going back to 1973, Tanya, it's for you're watching Fred Flintstone, right? The terrorist, or the, what, what was the burger they throw on the side of his car and it flips over? That's the sustainability reports of today and I don't like it. The Brontosaurus Burger, thank you, Richard. See, wise advice from the front, I love it. 
We're getting the Brontosaurus Burger Sustainability Reports and they don't add value. One of our four biggest banks in Canada just asked me here before the holidays last year, can you take a quick look at what we've done for our sustainability reporting? Not a problem. All I did was, here's what your CEO committed you to. This is what the Net Zero Financed uh, uh, Alliance looks like. Here's what your sustainability report says and here's what your TCFD report says. Here's all the inconsistencies. Here's everything that you missed. Here's at the end of the day what looked good, but you didn't provide value. And here's one example. We've doubled our uh, financing of electric vehicles. Did you add a value? Do you have a target? No. We have over 26 million registered motor vehicles in Canada, and I couldn't care less if you doubled from 2,000 to 4,000 vehicles. This is about value and disclosures for stakeholders around those things that are most material, some that are industry agnostic, and others that are particular to industries alone. What I'm challenging is we need to be specific as companies for disclosures, and we need to be discerning as users of that information, not just to say, here's Ed walking through a canola field with his child. Well, that looks really nice. They must be a sustainable company. It's <laughs> got to go a little bit further than that. I know I'm coming down on my timing. Here's one last story I'll share with you. Tanya, you brought up, again, sorry to keep pointing at you right now, but you just, you're in my line of sight. This is about balancing goals as well. I'm working with a utility down in the Caribbean, and one of the goals is we want to be 100% green energy. Well, that is a great and noble exercise to have a target. Here's the problem. The UN Sustainable Development Goals also says we need to have equitable and affordable energy for all. I could retrofit the entire island today with clean energy, but that infrastructure cost is gonna drive up energy costs to the point where your local community can't even afford electricity. I want to also challenge you, do not isolate and go after one topic alone. This is about raising the entire boat, and I'm hoping that we can talk about that in some of our panel discussion today. Thank you, that's my five minutes. I think I'm gonna be pulled off stage. Seth. Hello. All right. Everybody, uh, my name is Seth Foreman. I'm the president at Social Suite. Great to be here today. As Anna said, I almost didn't make it. Uh, on Sunday night, there were a lot of storms in the New York area, a lot of flight delays. I got on the, I was the last seat on the last flight out to get to Toronto and make it out here, or else it wouldn't have made it. Um, the gods of Kelowna were, were with us, and, and here we are. Um, and thanks to CSE, thanks. Richard and Ann and everybody for putting this event together. It's, uh, it's really fantastic to be here. So I'm, gonna, I, I'm only going to spend a few minutes. Uh, I'll do a quick intro about Social Suite, but I'm going to really focus my, uh, my time here on the why, why ESG is important, why ESG reporting is important, and what we're seeing in the market. So if we go to the next slide, please. Um, so a little bit about Social Suite. Oh, I have the clicker. Oh, great. Perfect. Um, so a little bit about Social Suite. So Social Suite is a ESG technology platform. We designed our entire platform specifically built for mainly micro cap and small cap companies to be simple, easy to use, and cost effective to help companies in particular get started on this ESG journey, given how complex and uh, overwhelming it can be. Uh, for these types of companies. We today, uh, we've raised a Series A about a year ago, and we now have 95 public companies on board across multiple different sectors from resources, biotech, uh, technology, and software. Um, okay, I'm gonna skip through because we've already taken care of what is ESG, so why is ESG important? Three main factors that we focus on at Social Suite, what we're seeing in the market mainly, it's about capital, um, customers, and then compliance. Uh, on the capital side, we've talked a lot about this today, there's somewhere around $10 trillion of ESG-driven capital in the market, in the markets today globally, mainly uh, driven by funds that look at and evaluate ESG-driven metrics 
uh, as part of that evaluation process um, in terms of where they're going to invest that capital. So why is that important for companies to have that ESG information on their websites and disclosed is because the funds that are out there require and need this ESG information to make those decisions. So if you don't have ESG metrics and you haven't started that ESG journey as a public company, you potentially could get screened out from a lot of these investors. And so what that does by ESG reporting is that it widens your net of potential capital, it potentially can lower your cost of capital, so there's a lot of benefits around that at the institutional level. And then there's also a lot of research at the retail level where there's particularly younger retail investors um, look highly across companies that are on that sustainability and ESG track. So the investor side is really important. The second factor here is around customers. Um, what we're referring to here is a lot of multinational companies um, are starting to look at their supply chains and um, really putting in place mandates and strongly encouraging their suppliers to have and start tracking ESG information. This goes for the Teslas of the world, the GMs, the Fords, big companies that are really starting this, and it goes all the way down supplier level down into the actual uh, exploration level where they're really starting to ask for information about emissions, um, certain social uh, requests around things like diversity, and really trying to push their suppliers to be more sustainable um, given the pressures that they're under to enhance and improve their reporting. So if you're even in an early stage company and you're looking to establish offtake agreements or even if you're trying to uh, sell your product up into a larger company, having that e even just baseline reporting about your plans around sustainability and ESG is really, really important. Again, another reason to get started. And then the third area that my, uh, my peers just addressed around compliance, it's coming uh, out of the United States. The SEC is expected to, pa to um, uh, finalize their climate disclosure ruling this October, which is expected to be the final action. Where they're going to be requiring um, first large public companies and on down to smaller public companies to have certain aspects of their climate disclosures, things like their emissions and certain climate analysis that will be required. And we're seeing this globally. Out of Europe, it's already required for certain size companies. And then also in Canada and Australia, there's certain proposals in place that's expected to be finalized relatively soon. Another reason to get started to educate and begin that journey. I got 50 seconds. I'm gonna just go to one other point here. Um, now, ESG reporting is not only important for certain stakeholders, but it's also shown to be and, and have really positive business results for companies. Um, not only to help with um, uh, lowering your cost of capital, um, better business performance, but from an investor side as well, a significant proportion of investors are looking at ESG reporting as, a, again, a, an important part of that evaluation process. And there's a lot of data points here to really prove that point out as to why it's so important to get started. Um, and again, I think this, this deck will be provided after the fact. And last slide is really around that, that journey and starting point. And Social Suite has spent a lot of time phasing out programs for different size companies, helping smaller companies get started on that journey through a really that initiate and align phase. And then companies that are a little bit farther along in that journey, helping them uh, continue to progress, continue to um, provide information and uh, report on multiple different frameworks that are out in the market that investors are asking for, that customers are asking for, and so on and so forth. So looking forward to our panel right now so we can uh, dive into this topic even further. So thanks, everybody. Thank you, gentlemen. That was great, actually. I, I like that rapid fire. Um, so, so we do have some canned questions, some topics we wanted to talk about, but definitely encourage anyone to raise their hand if they want to ask a question to any of these folks. Uh, we do have some microphones floating around, so if you do have a question, feel free to raise your hand. Any start off, or is it my turn? All right. Nicole, a microphone's coming your way. Quickly. <laughs> or you can come up and use one of these. Yeah, there you go. 
this may be a tough one to start off with, but uh, Kelly Shule, uh, I think Shu at the Yale School of Management, um, did a study on ESG investing, focusing on a sustainability. And her hypothesis was that, and by the way, I, I was in CSR at Disney for 10 years, so I, it's not like I'm anti any of this, but um, she hypothesized that actually if we were to invest into ESG investments in big oil companies, for example, like they did with, I think it was Impact One out of San Francisco, put money into Exxon's um, sustainability fund so they could develop, um, you know, uh, proper ways of doing things for the environment, that that would actually have a greater impact than if we were to invest in companies that are what we think of as, as green companies, and that that would be profoundly bigger impact on the environment. So anyhow, I'm starting off with a very controversial topic. Bold. Bold. What are your thoughts on that? Well, thanks for tenderizing us for this <laughs> panel right now. Um, I, I'll put a little asterisk next to my head right now. So if this is being taped, it may not necessarily be that of MMP, but that of Edward. <laughs> The reason why I can still land in Calgary and not have a face of, if, if you see him, put him back on a plane and send him home, is because I'm not necessarily the all or none, turn off all fossil fuels. I think there was a missed opportunity in terms of fossil fuels around what could have and should have been done. And now it's a speed, let's get back up to where we should have been that could have been done 20 years ago. So there's a tremendous opportunity, and I think there's a great opportunity because I used to run an alternative energy company. I could always get through central heating, cooling, domestic hot water, maybe 80% of the energy needs for a building. Unfortunately, that last 20%, I would go to electricity and natural gas. So I'm a big hashtag energy that it's an energy mix requirement, and there's still a definitive role to be played, but there's innovation to be done that can help us in transitioning to a lower carbon economy. So I'm still a believer in the roles, but not a what we've always done will always work. I think there's a change in the value and the expectations and we need to change accordingly. So that's just a first thought on my end. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm with you, Edward. And I, I think that it's, um, look, we're, we're going through a transition. This is not a, hey, and, and, and I've, there's a lot of, hey, let's stop funding fossil fuel. I mean, if you, if you cut off fossil fuels today, you know, the, the world, it goes into anarchy. Like, you can't have that, right? There, there's, this is a 20 to 30 year transition, and it's going to take time to get there, and there needs to be tremendous investment into clean tech and clean technologies and moving towards a sustainable future. Um, and I think that even the Exxon Mobiles of the world, they are doing a lot to try to work through that transition. And you know, at the end of the day, ExxonMobil, they do have an expertise in extraction. We have a massive mining problem where we're trying to, there's a, there's a tremendous amount of demand that we need and there's not enough supply. So there's companies like that, like the ExxonMobil's of the world that can really help with that extraction, make us move faster on that, on, on trying to catch up on the, on the extraction point because we need a lot of critical minerals and such that's out there. So I, I think that, again, it goes back to that transition and, and pushing forward on that way, but it needs to be um, pragmatic in, in that approach that we take. So as the, Calgary, as the Calgary guy, I need to say something on this, and I'm gonna, first of all, start by thanking Ed and Seth for, for making what I think is really the main comment, or the, the major response to that question, but I'm gonna maybe provide a slightly different perspective because um, there's an angle to that question that is a really live debate right now going on in Canada in the sustainable finance space. So I do a lot of work with the International Capital Markets Association, um, helping them design a set of principles that can apply to labeled finance products. So if you wanted to label a bond or a, a loan as green or sustainable or sustainability linked, there's a set of principles that you can follow uh, in order to apply that label. And in Canada, given our extractive economy, fossil fuel based, we've done a lot of work around the appropriate use of the transition label uh, on that kind of financial tool. Um, and there is actually a sort of a taxonomy, a transition finance taxonomy roadmap, I think is what it's called, that's out there in front of the, that's been developed by a federally appointed panel of experts. Um, so you can understand the way it probably leans, right, in terms of how that works. Um, 
but the suggestion, you know, the debate is the extent to which uh, natural gas producers should be able to, for example, or consumers use that transition label, right? And the risk is that if you believe that the use of these tools is a way to drive capital towards a transition or towards a greener, uh, sustainable uh, future, that you end up um, uh, restricting the use of these labels such that companies, brown, you know, brown industries that actually really need to do the transition, and a lot of these companies are, are committed to transitioning, they're not going to be able to use those tools, right? And which is not going to be helpful in driving this transition, right? So that's just another, just another approach. But thank you for making the, the main Alberta response uh, to that. So appreciate that, yeah. <laughs> Does anyone else have any other questions? Oh, one over here. So for those who couldn't hear, the primary question was, should it be mandated for capital market participants or every company? Public companies. Public companies. OK. That's the question, just so everybody could hear it. <laughs> you want me to go first? So, yeah, uh, it's, a, it's a very important question. I think in general, so one is that we're already moving on that that roadmap. So it's coming and, you know, as I mentioned earlier, the SEC of the US is going to um, likely, it's supposed to pass in October. Canada, Australia, other markets, Europe's already on that track. Um, so yeah, personally, I think it's important that it is mandated. Uh, I think the question is the implementation of it. Do I think that a uh, Fortune 100 company should have the exact same mandates around disclosure as a, uh, as an, as a, uh, explorer on the CSE that's just getting going. So that that is a big no. I think that there really needs to be, and, and I don't think the regulatory the regulators have done enough, uh, spend enough time thinking this through, um, because it's really not fair to a smaller public company to have the same disclosures as a Fortune 100 that has a chief sustainability officer that has a team of 100 ESG experts versus a company that doesn't have any. ESG or chief sustainability officer. So that is, the, I think that's the big question, um, and that's a big gap right now that that I'm hoping the regulators, as they think through these mandates, can can address because it really needs to be simple and cost effective for the smaller companies. But they should um, report on information. It's just a matter of what and what does that look like. And I would just add very briefly that when you look at the deployment of capital, it's about protecting capital as well. So if we don't see what the disclosure, the transition, the target, the performance, then even financed emissions right now as a bank or as a uh, credit union or other, you're going to be saying, is there underlying uh, collateral value erosion? Is there an inability to debt service? Will I be able to recoup on the capital that I've invested? This is about business resilience. So for me as an investor, I'd be saying, I need to consume this information. Where are you? And we do need to have the accommodation because it's not a one size fit all. So I really appreciate that. There needs to be disclosures, but it has to be in the right transition for the small and mid-sized entities in Canada. And it has to be aligned with expectations to understand that business resilience linked back to capital. So it's a, almost an indirect but direct way of saying, yes, we need it, but it's not a one size fits all. So thank you. Yeah, and look, I would agree with everything that's been said here, but what I would add is that, um, you know, <clears throat> sadly, Canada is somewhat late to the game in this whole space, right, in terms of uh, making propo disclosure proposals and certainly uh, anything around mandating um, climate-related disclosures. Um, Canadian capital markets uh, are global, right? We, capital moves in and out of Canada. Um, if we want, uh, my, my personal view is if we want to remain a credible 
uh, capital market in Canada, uh, we do need to have a level of mandated disclosure around climate climate risk. We know that when the CSA put out its proposals, it's one of one of its proposal was, uh, well, you don't need to disclose any of your emissions, but if you don't, you should just explain why, right? Which presumably could have included, well, it's hard, right? So, but the CSA got seriously criticized for that uh, because investors. Uh, are global, and they're not, you know, the, I think they, they're, the message was, uh, you know, you're going to lose credibility as a capital market for, for deployment of capital unless you have some level of disclosure that's required, so. Tanya? <laughs> I think we have a mic over there. You can bring it. So my question is for Edward. You had a stat on your last slide that talked about Did you mean it for Seth? Seth. Yeah, sorry, Seth. That's okay. The other, the other. other sorry, the other oh. end. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, no, yeah, yeah, Tanya, it's a good, good question. Um, yeah, I think that the, another really important piece of this is the employees. Um, and so, you know, we do have research that shows that, again, this is particularly for your, your uh, employees that are either just coming out of college or just starting out in their careers, like, particularly for the, the younger generation, that you know at the end of the day, you know, sustainability is so important for them because this is the world that they're going to live in, and they're seeing what's happening with climate change, and they they want to work for a company that's like, having real impact, that cares deeply and is transparent about all these different types of sustainability and ESG issues. And so for them, for the companies that are starting to report and are transparent about their plans um, across these different ESG factors, it does show that from a recruitment and from a retainment standpoint, um, it's, it's a big boost to those efforts. And at the end of the day, we are people organizations. And so to attract that talent that you need, having that, having that, that ESG steps is, is, a, is, is, is important. One thing I, I want to ask before we move along, I, we might have time for one more question, but um, I think one thing um, that comes up a lot is this idea of greenwashing. So I just want to touch on that for a moment. Um, it's a pretty scary idea, but where in disclosure and reporting as an investor could you investigate that or have some idea that that's what you're buying into? Maybe, maybe start off by explaining properly what greenwashing is. Sure. Um, well, I'll start, I'll start on this one. I mean, greenwashing actually does not have uh, any sort of uh, specific meaning, but generally I think what people mean by it is either unsubstantiated disclosure around uh, environmental matters, so climate risk, for example, but it can also be social washing, so around uh, social, social issues like DE&I and uh, supply chain issues. So. Um, it means that, or it means disclosure about any of those things that uh, misrepresents, um, you know, the state of the state of play within an organization. So, uh, the best example is a large oil and gas company advertising how you know it's uh, it's a development of a wind farm somewhere, right? Um, but without the context of that investment comprising sort of 1% of its capex in one year versus 99% going towards oil and gas, you know, exploring new oil and gas, it somewhat misrepresents sort of the true uh, approach of that company. So that's kind of what greenwashing is. And, and where would you go to source out if, if, you were, if a company was greenwashing? Well, and, and it's interesting that you bring that up because as we see the evolution of mandatory disclosures globally, you typically see the mandatory assurance requirements following suit. And so when you look at disclosures right now, there's disclosures publicly by a company, but there's also the business to business disclosures that are gonna come with a requirement related to, if Seth is capital markets and I'm private enterprise, he has to comply for disclosures, I'm in his supply chain, by essence of you being mandated to, I also will because I'm in that supply chain, 
he needs to trust my disclosure, and it can't be, well, Ed seems like a good guy, I'm going to trust it. There's going to be a cascading order of assurance that will be required, and it will be needed. Otherwise, we won't get to that point to having comfort around, is this truly greenwashing, that you're overstating something, or you're understating your actual exposure to try and protect the optics in order to secure capital. So to me, there is a risk. That risk has to be addressed through assurance, but assurance standards have to change. That's why we're working through a lot of different assurance and uh, auditing and assurance standards board for Canada right now. And isn't that part of the process with the Modern Slavery Act, right? It is that it's, it's in the chain and you have to have assurances that that's not happening in a country where something might be manufactured. I was just gonna say yes, yeah. and now the hard part is how far will companies be pressed in order to prove it? Uh, I was just using, I think it was with you last night, Bill, I was talking about the import of coffee beans into Canada, and when I asked the company, where do you source your beans? Oh, it's from a good wholesaler in the U.S. Well, how did you prove that they have ensured that it did not come from, and they said, we don't know. The we don't know is not going to carry any type of weight moving forward. It's now the, I need to be able to answer that question, and if you can't, that responsibility is now on you. And in turn, that country would have to ab abide by those standards as well, right? Go ahead, Seth. No, I was just going to go back to the, from a greenwashing standpoint, I mean, we look, at the end of the day, it's really, if you're going to say it and say things as it relates to your uh, sustainability efforts, you need to do it, and there needs to be action. Um, and so that's, that's really what it, what it comes down to. I think that part of you know, wh why greenwashing has been a lot of front page news recently and there's been a lot of companies that are being called out and funds being called out for this is part of it is that there's been such a lack of clarity around the standards and rules and what is, what is good, what is not good, what is sustainability. There's a lot of cleanup that's happening right now. It's going to continue to happen. I think it'll improve drastically now that you have regulations coming. There's a bit more clarity around like, what is good and who's doing things well. And that ultimately will... Um, come around to it, but 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 I think Bill, or someone mentioned green hushing. The flip side of that is that now with a lot of companies being called out for greenwashing, you're now seeing this. Uh, a lot of companies being really cautious around how they communicate what they're doing around sustainability, and that's where the green hushing turn comes in, because companies are now continuing to have action around what they're doing from a sustainability standpoint, but they're being a little bit more careful around how they're communicating it publicly, so that they're not. Um, you know, obviously they don't want to get called out for the greenwashing uh, side of things. So it's a real, it's a lot of balance and a lot of tricky dance that companies are playing right now. But most importantly, they're all continuing on that journey. Amazing. Thank you. Um, we do have to move along, but do you have a quick question? Uh, no. Yeah, I'll answer it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> quick answers, gentlemen. <laughs> I'll make it really quick for me. We're trying, first of all, to disconnect politics from sustainability, and unfortunately, that's linked right now. So we're trying to separate that as my first barrier. The second barrier is when I say to the, uh, I've been working with many boards, oh, so it's okay, you would like to have children under the age of 12 working for you. Well, no. Well, okay, so you're not against a social issue. Um, I would like to take the uh, waste oil that we have and go dump it in the lake that's close by. That's okay, right? Well, no, we're not gonna do that. So all of this is prudent business practice that they would not do. Unfortunately, we have that first barrier of politics involved. I'm going back to the essentials of how do we create value? How do we preserve value? How does sustainability drive that? Now, how do we disclose that story? Because if you don't write it, somebody's writing it about you too. Yeah, look, our firm, we, uh, we have, uh, we're in the US as well. Our firm has received a letter from the Senate Committee on Antitrust, right? Uh, essentially, that about 50 law firms in the US received essentially threatening the law firm uh, uh, over antitrust investigation around our participation or potential participation in encouraging 
non-competitive behavior through um, and anti-competitive behavior uh, through uh, you know promotion of ESG, right? Um, and so we you know we've had to take we've had to really have a have a thorough look at that um, and assess what we would do. But at the end of the day, we've got our overwhelming uh, volume of clients that want advice um, in the space, and uh, and so you know we we provide that advice. So yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I'm, I'm also based in the U.S. It's, of course, being in the ESG business, you're seeing a lot of controversial action around this. I think at the end of the day, where is it coming from? You have certain aspects on the anti-ESG movement. They just believe that company, any investor should be only looking at the financial side of a company. And that's part of it. You have uh, aspects of lobbyists involved. You have aspects of a lot of confusion. ESG is relatively new for most of the average uh, person out there. And so it's easily manipulated into like, this is really bad, but I think people don't really understand what it is. So a lot of it, there needs to be a lot more education, um, a lot more action on the pro ESG and sustainability side of all the benefits around this. Um, there's a lot, it, it's, 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 it's a quite a deep topic, um, but I think from a, and, and it's become politicized as well. Uh, so it, at the end of the day, I think that, um, you know, there, as long as there's a force out there that's really stating the overall benefits and the positive action around sustainability and ESG, then, you know, it's, because we have, we don't have a choice. You know, it's really, you know, if, if we, if the global, if everybody globally doesn't do anything around this, then, you know, where, where are we in 50 years? So this absolutely has to happen and, um, you know, it's, it's, it's really around action. Thank you so much. Listen, gentlemen, thank you so much. I was thinking this would be the start of a good joke, right? A lawyer, an auditor, and, and an ESG reporter walk onto a stage. <laughs> Um, they will be around on and off throughout the day, and I know there's more questions, but um, they will be around, So, and I can make sure that I introduce you, so if you reach out to me, I can make introductions. Gentlemen, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Anna.